In this video we're going to look at how the concepts of work and energy can be used together to solve a wide range of mechanics problems. The energy of an object measures the object's ability to do some work. So if a body has got some energy and does some work against the force then part of the energy is used up. And equally, if a work is done on an object by a force, then the object gains some energy. Thus, if we've got a mechanics situation and some work is done on the object, then that will produce a change in the energy of the object. Now we're particularly interested in mechanical energy. Our mechanical energy is energy that might be kinetic energy, which is energy due to the motion of the object. It might be gravitational potential energy, which is energy due to the position of the object. And in this video we will be considering just kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy. But in a later video, we will also be looking at the mechanics of elastic strings and springs. And for an elastic string or spring, if the string or spring is stretched, then, the, it, then it is storing some elastic potential energy. Now there are lots of other types of energy other than mechanical energy. There's heat energy, sound energy, light energy, electrical energy, chemical energy, etc. But as far as we're concerned, throughout the module, we will be con concentrating on mechanical en energy. And mechanical energy of a system is simply the sum of the potential energies and the kin kinetic energies of the objects under consideration. Now, if during the motion of the object there are no changes in all of these different non-mechanical types of energy, then we can say that the mechanical energy of an object measures the object's ability to do some mechanical work. So if a body has mechanical energy and does some mechanical work against a force, then part of that energy is used up. Conversely, if mechanical work is done on an object by a force, then the object gains some energy. Thus, we have the important principle that if mechanical work is done on the object, then we get a change in the mechanical energy of the object. So we'll now consider the kinetic energy of an object moving at speed v. Suppose we have a block of mass m then which moves distance s in a straight line whilst being accelerated from rest to a speed of v by a constant force f acting in the same direction as the displacement. Then we can say that the kinetic energy of the block at the end of the motion is entirely due to the work done by F which is equal to F times S. Now, making use of the mechanics that we already have, Newton's second law tells us that F is equal to M times A and the constant acceleration equations tell us that V squared is equal to the initial velocity squared which is naught squared plus 2AS so we've got v squared is equal to 2as, or equivalently, we have got that f times s is the same thing as m times a times s, but a times s is exactly one half v squared. So we've got f times s is the same thing as a half m v squared. So we can say that the kinetic energy of the block at the end of the motion is the work done 
by f, which is f times s, which is the same thing as a half mv squared. So we've proved that the kinetic energy of an object of mass m moving with speed v is one half mv squared. Now we're going to see throughout this video that balancing work done on an object with the energy gains or the energy changes of the object gives us a really valuable alternative means of tackling problems. And we'll see this in our first example. So we have a puck of mass 0.3 kilograms is pushed in a straight line across a smooth horizontal surface by a constant force P. As it passes a point C on the surface, the puck has speed 2 meters per second. As it point passes a point D on the surface, where CD is 0.7 meters, the puck has speed 2.28 meters per second. We've got to calculate the size of the force P. And in the first case, we've got to use constant acceleration equations and Newton's second law. So, as in most mechanics problems, we'll start by drawing a diagram to show the situation. So, using the constant acceleration equation, v squared equals u squared plus 2as, we have 2.28 squared equals 2 squared plus 2 times 0.7 times by the acceleration, which gives me 1.1984 equals 1.4a. In other words, the acceleration is 0.856 meters per second squared. If we now add the forces acting on the puck to our diagram, the forces we've got acting on the puck are the force P in the direction CD together with the weight and the normal reaction on the puck. Applying Newton's second law in the direction CD, we've got P is the resultant force, must equal 0.3 times by A, that's the mass times the acceleration, which gives me P equals 0.257 Newtons. Now we can answer the same question using a work energy balance. So again, we've got the diagram. And we can say that the work done by P produces the change in the kinetic energy of the puck. So we've got the work done by P is the gain in kinetic energy of the puck, which is the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. The work done by P is the component of P in the direction of the motion times by the distance moved, which is 0.7. The component of P in the direction of CD is just P. So we've got P times 0.7 is the work done by P, is the final kinetic energy, which is a half times 0.3 times 2.28 squared, minus the initial kinetic energy, which is a half times 0.3 times 2 squared. So we've got 0.7p equals 0.17976. Divide each side by 0.7, we get p equals 0.257 newtons, exactly as before. The advantage of this method of solution is we've only needed to use one mechanical principle. We've just used the work energy balance. In the previous solution, we had to use the constant acceleration equations together with Newton's second law. We'll now have a brief look at potential energy. If we have a block of mass m dropped from rest from a height h above the floor, then in falling to ground level, the block is going to do the weight is going to do work mgh on the block. So, whilst the block is held in its initial position, 
it's storing the ability to do some work and it's storing the ability to do work of size mgh. So we say that mgh is the gravitational potential energy of the block relative to the floor. Now when we're dealing with potential energy it's important that we've got an idea of where we are measuring the potential energy relative to. So we set up the idea of a zero potential energy level. The importance of this will become clear in the next example. So we've got a two-story house with a basement and we've got a five kilogram parcel which at the moment is sitting on the bedroom floor. And we have to find the potential energy of that five kilogram parcel relative to first of all the ground floor, secondly the basement floor and then finally to the attic floor. Well if we're working relative to the ground floor, the ground floor is our level of zero potential energy. The parcel is four meters above that so the potential energy of the parcel is going to be its mass 5 times by g times by 4 which gives me 196 joules. If we're working relative to the basement floor then the basement floor needs to be my level of zero potential energy in which case the potential energy of the parcel now is 5 times g times 6.5 because the parcel is 6.5 meters above the zero potential energy level. So the potential energy of the parcel relative to the attic floor is 318.5 joules. If we're working relative to the attic floor then the attic floor must be my level of zero potential energy the parcel is 4 meters below the attic floor so in order to, to lift the parcel up to the attic floor we would have to do some work in which case we've got a negative potential energy in this case and the negative potential energy is 5 times g times minus 4 because the parcel is 4 meters below the zero potential energy level and that gives me minus 196 joules. For the next example we've got a sledge of mass 24 kilograms is pushed 20 meters up a smooth slope inclined at 10 degrees to the horizontal. At the bottom of the slope the trolley speed was 1.5 meters per second and at the top of the slope its speed is 1.9 meters per second we have to calculate the work done the work that has been done on the sledge during this time so again start starting with a diagram now the work that's done on the sledge is going to be producing the change in energy of the sledge during the course of its motion the sledge has gained some kinetic energy and it's gained some potential energy. So we can say that the work done on the sledge is equal to the gain in the potential energy plus the gain in the kinetic energy. The gain in the kinetic energy always needs to be done as being the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. So, the gain in potential energy the, is going to be the mass of the sledge, 24 kilograms, times by g, times by the height gained by the sledge. Now we're calling the zero potential energy the initial bottom of the slope, or the initial level. The height gained during the motion is going to be 20 times sine 10 because we've got a right angle triangle the slope provides the hypotenuse and we know that that's 20 meters long the slope is making an angle of 10 degrees with the horizontal 
So using elementary trigonometry, we're trying to find the opposite side to get the height. So we've got the opposite divided by 20, 20 is equal to sine 10. So the opposite side, the height gain, is 20 sine 10. So the gain in potential energy is 24 times by g times by 20 sine 10. The final kinetic energy is a half times 24 times 1.9 squared. And the initial kinetic energy is a half times 24 times 1.5 squared. So the work done can now be worked out on our calculator. And we've got the work done is 833 joules. Now at this stage, pause the video. And there are three fairly simple questions here to do, dealing with just energy and its link with work. When you've done that, press continue on the video because there's some more material yet to come. Okay, so moving on. So the mechanical energy of a system is simply the total kinetic energy and potential energy of the system. Okay, and as we've already stated, we in mechanics, we concentrate on just kinetic and potential energy. We've already seen that work done by the forces acting on a system leads to a change in the energy of that system. If there are no external forces acting on the system that are doing any work, other than the weight, and work done by the weight is looked after by the potential energy terms, so we don't need to worry about that, or the tension in an elastic string, and as we'll see later, the work done by the tension is looked after by considering elastic potential energy, so if there are no external forces acting on the system that are doing any work other than weight or the tension in an elastic string, then the mechanical energy of the system will be constant, provided the system undergoes no sudden changes, such as receiving an impulse or having a collision. And this principle is known as the conservation of mechanical energy. So the mechanical energy of a system remains constant provided there are no external forces other than the weight and or the tension in an elastic string which do any work and provided that there are no sudden changes such as impacts in the motion. Now, there are several different ways of setting up our work energy balances or our setting up our conservation of energy equations. The net work done by a system of forces is the same thing as the sum of all of the work done by forces minus the sum of all of the work done against any forces. And that gives us the change in mechanical energy. It gives us the final mechanical energy minus the initial mechanical energy. Or we could say that the net work done by the forces plus the initial mechanical energy equals the final mechanical energy. And as we said, since the net work done by the forces is equal to the work, total work done by the forces minus the total work done against any forces, we can rewrite the balance as saying that the total work done by the forces is equal to the change in mechanical energy plus the total work done against the forces. When we use the conservation of energy in a mechanics question, we can either say that the initial mechanical energy of the system equals the final mechanical energy of the system, 
or we can equally well say that all of the mechanical energy gains of the system are equal to all of the mechanical energy losses of the system. And we'll see these different ways of setting up energy, work energy balances and the conservation of energy in the following examples. So for example 4, we have saffron of mass 35 kilograms slides down a water slide in a park. Starting from rest, she slides from the point A to the point B, which is 15 meters vertically below the level of A, as shown in the diagram. In an initial model, all resistive forces are ignored. We have to use an energy method to predict saffron's speed at the bottom of the slide. Well, if we're saying that there are no resistive forces present, then the only forces acting on saffron as she slides down the slide are going to be the weight and her normal reaction. The normal reaction is perpendicular to the motion, so does no work. So we can apply the conservation of energy and we can say that the loss of potential energy is going to be equal to the gain in saffron's kinetic energy. The loss of potential energy is going to be 35 times g times 15 and that will be equal to saffron's kinetic energy at the bottom of the slide which is going to be a half mv squared so that's a half times 35 times v squared which ends up giving us v squared is 294 so v is 17.1 meters per second the resistive forces that we have ignored are frictional force so there's friction of saffron against the slide and there'll also be some air resistance And then we've got an improved model which assumes that the resistive forces are constant and we're told that the slide is actually 45 meters long and that saffron speed at the bottom of the slide is actually 12 meters per second. We're going to try and find the size of these resistive forces. So we're going to need an improved diagram first of all showing the forces acting on saffron. So we've now got her weight. We've got the normal reaction as before but we've also got the resistive forces which we've called R in the diagram here and it's the size of R that we're going to try and find out. Now we're going to use an energy work balance here so we can say that the loss in potential energy as saffron goes down the slide is going to create a gain in kinetic energy but it's also going to do work against the resistance so the loss in potential energy is equal to the gain in kinetic energy plus the work done against the resistance the loss in potential energy is again 35 times g times 15 the gain in kinetic energy is, well, at the top of the slide she had no speed, at the bottom of the slide she's got speed 12 meters per second. So the gain in kinetic energy is, a half, is the final kinetic energy, a half times 35 times 12 squared. Take away the initial kinetic energy, a half times 35 times naught squared. And the work done against the resistance is going to be simply R times 45 because R is acting in the opposite direction to the, slide, uh, to the motion. So the work done against R is just R times 45. So tidying that up, we've got 5145 equals 2520 plus 45R. So R 
is equal to 5145, take away 2520, all divided by 45, which gives us a, a, um, resistive forces of 58.3 newtons. For our next example, we have a smooth bead, which is threaded onto a circular wire of radius 0.25 meters and center C. The wire is fixed in a vertical plane with the bead at rest at the lowest point A and is then projected from that point A with speed 2.8 meters per second. We've got to find the height above A when it first comes to rest. So, a little later in the motion, A will still be on the circular wire, removing the speed V and the only forces acting on the bead are going to be its weight and the normal reaction. And then at its highest point, we've got no velocity at that point, it's just going about to fall back down again. Now the work done by or against the weight is looked after by the potential energy calculations. And the reaction, R, is perpendicular to the motion, so therefore does no work. So we can apply the conservation of energy, and if we're going to apply the conservation of energy, we probably ought to decide where our zero potential energy level is, and it's certainly easiest to put this at the bottom of the motion. So if we apply the conservation of energy at this stage, we have the energy of the particle at A must equal the energy of the particle at B. The mechanical energy at A is the potential energy at A plus the kinetic energy at A. The mechanical energy at B is the potential energy at B plus the kinetic energy at B. At A, there is no potential energy, but the kinetic energy is a half times m times 2.8 squared. At B, the potential energy is mg times h, but it is at rest at B, because that's the highest point where it first comes to rest, so the kinetic energy at B is zero. So on the right hand side, we've got mg times h plus a half times m times zero squared, which is zero. So at the end of the day, then, we have, the m's will cancel each other out, and we've got h is going to equal 2.8 squared divided by 2g, which gives me h is 0.4 meters. In our next example, we have a pulley system. We have a 7 kilogram mass and a 5 kilogram mass, and at the moment, as it's set up, the 7 kilogram mass is, hanging, is being held hanging, and the 5 kilogram is at rest on the floor. Why can't we just apply conservation of energy to the 7 kilogram mass? Well, as we release the system, the 7 kilogram mass is going to be experiencing its weight acting down and the tension in the string acting upwards. And that tension in the string acting upwards is going to be doing some work. And therefore, there is going to be no chance of applying the conservation of energy. If we assume there is no air resistance, if we assume the pulley is smooth and light and the strings are light and extensible, then the work done by t the work done by the seven kilogram mass against T will be equal to in size the work done by the tension in accelerating the five kilogram mass. So the conservation of energy can be applied to the whole system. So let's try and do precisely that. 
So there's the diagram at the start of the motion and the diagram just before the 7 kilogram mass hits the floor. Let's suppose the 7 kilogram mass hits the floor with speed v. Since the string is inextensible, that means the 5 kilogram mass must be going up with speed v. So, applying conservation of energy to the whole system, we can say that the energy for the the initial energy for the 7 kilogram mass plus the initial energy for the 5 kilogram mass must equal the final energy for the 7 kilogram mass plus the final energy for the 5 kilogram mass. Now initially the 7 kilogram mass has no kinetic energy it has potential energy of 7 times g times 0.3. Initially the 5 kilogram mass has no potential energy and has no kinetic energy. Just before the 7 kilogram mass hits the floor the 7 kilogram mass is going to have kinetic energy of a half times 7 times v squared and it's going to have no potential energy. And at this instant, the 5 kilogram mass is going to have kinetic energy of a half times 5 times v squared, together with potential energy of 5 times g times 0.3. So, if we tidy that up, we end up with 20.58 on the left-hand side equals 6v squared plus 14.7. And that means that we've got 6v squared is 5.88. In other words, v is 0.99 meters per second. Our final example, we have a box of mass 30 kilograms is dragged up a slope by a man who exerts a constant force of magnitude 250 newtons at an angle of 15 degrees above the slope. The slope is inclined at 25 degrees to the horizontal and the total resistance to the motion is R newtons. The box passes a point A on the slope with a speed of 1.4 meters per second and later passes a point B which is 18 meters further up the slope with speed 2.9 meters per second. We have to calculate first of all the work done by the 250 Newton force in dragging the box from A to B and then we have to use a work energy balance to find the value of R. The work done by the 250 Newton force is going to be equal to the component of the 250 newton force in the direction of the motion times by the distance moved. The component of the 250 newton force in the direction of the slope is 250 cos 15. And we've got to then find the work done by the 250 newton force. We've got 250 cos 15 times by 18, which gives us 4,346.7 joules. So we're now going to use a work energy balance to find the value of R. We can say that the work done by the 250 newtons is going to produce a gain in the potential energy of the block it's going to give us a gain in the kinetic energy of the block and it's also going to overcome the, it's going to have to do the, some work against the resistive forces so the work done by the man produces a gain in potential energy of the block a gain in the kinetic energy of the block and also 
the man has to do this work against the resistive forces. So we've got 4346.7 is equal to first of all the gain in the potential energy of the block. Well the mass of the block is 30 kilograms so the potential energy is going to be 30 times by g times by the height gain of the block. Now the block has moved 18 meters up the slope. The slope makes an angle of 25 degrees with the horizontal. So the height gain h is equal to 18 sine 25. So the potential energy gain is 30 g times 18 sine 25. The gain in the kinetic energy is the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. So that is a half times 30 times 2.9 squared. Take away a half times 30 times 1.4 squared. And the work done against the resistance in moving the block um, 18 meters up the slope is going to be R times 18. So there's no small amount of um, calculator work to do here. So we've got 4346.7 is equal to 2236.5 plus 96.75 plus 18R. That simplifies to so 18R is 2013.4 so the resistive force is 111.9 newtons. And that concludes this video on, which can, looks at work and energy.